Welcome everyone. This is our 10th and final talk of our Spring Back series to get you ready for 2021 and beyond. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Crafting Europe who have funded this series and to all of our guest speakers, including those of that will be joining us today. Um, it's been a really successful series and I sincerely hope you've enjoyed it. All of these talks have been created by the Crafts Council. And for the purposes of today, just a reminder, we have interpretation for Ukrainian uh, makers joining us. And any questions that you might have throughout this session, please use the Q&A function. Before I invite our guests, Ella Doran and Flora Collingwood Norris, um, I'm going to set the context of this webinar and in particular how it is a part of this whole series that we've had. Just a reminder of our Spring Back Talk series. We kicked off with identifying your brand values. And this is really, really important. If you haven't had a chance to see this, really to help you identify why. Why do you do what you do? By identifying this really important value um, can really help others understand what you offer, your products, and also can consolidate your ideas when you're looking for new opportunities. It's also worth to mention here, Simon Sinek's The Why, uh, for a little bit of inspiration to, to get you going. Then we had how to build your customer profiles. Again, once you've identified the why, then you can really understand your potential customers. If you don't know who your customers are, then how do you know what to say, when to say it and where to say it? So this is really important. And for those of you who have not seen our Market for Craft data tool, make use of this. It's a really good starting point to find out about customers. Also, another good starting point, if you've made a few sales, try and drill down a little bit more into their particular profiles. This will really help get you started. Then we had getting the most out of Instagram, video is your friend, working with the media, getting the most out of Facebook. Whether you're working with the media or having more specific um, marketing through your social media streams, it all links to your why. So finesse what you do now um, and give it the best chance to have success and review before moving on to the next idea. Then we had how to present your ideas to a client. I really wanted to highlight here, building relationships with clients is a skill and once learned can be super beneficial for developing your and instigating new ideas. Next, we had honing your writing skills. And this is very much about broadening your language and being more specific. This will help other, uh, others understand what you do. Again, honing your writing skills will support your business as a whole as you branch out into new ideas and this will support it also. Finally, we had how to take advantage of the experience economy. Much of our previous talk highlighted the opportunities coming out of the demand for experiences, much could lead into other income streams. There's some key takeaways of what we've learned. Know what is important to you to, you, to drive your business forward with a passion. Do your research, I cannot say this enough. 
do your research, use fact, not assumptions. Clients, this is very much from Patricia, fans at Eka. Clients are often a reflection of who you are. When commissioning others, have a plan of what you want to achieve and why, and be open to other creative ideas so that you can have a real true collaboration with your clients and others. Having the confidence in what you do will give your clients confidence in buying what you offer. Passion makes a story, speak from the heart. And it very much came from our talk on working with the media. Factor in time properly and document your finished products and projects to use for future marketing. Read more widely. This came from Stephen and Kimberly for honing your writing skills. The more you read, the more expansive your writing becomes. And finally, time is a gift. The way we experience time this is from Abdullah Nafisi in our last talk. The way we experience time has changed. We are in a time of globalization, live, giving us choices, and we now have experiences in different ways. Our expectation of time has changed through new technologies. As a whole, we want to do more. Happiness to do more with others. Artists and makers can take for granted their creativity, whilst others want to experience this creativity through experiences. So think about the series as a whole and other income streams in relation to your business as a whole, the rationale, the why. Sean Sutcliffe from Benchmark Furniture says it all. Be flexible and adaptable and look for opportunities and don't ignore the business. Research, and I say this statement so often, you cannot plan without data. Planning. When are you going to make this happen? Always set a deadline, plan backwards and be smart. That is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time bound. The structure, put a budget and time behind your ideas to give it a real chance of success and review this. Connections, identify who it is for. I said, look back to those previous talks. Who do you want to connect to? And does your marketing inspire people to connect with you? For the future, set goals and targets for now and in the future to allow your business to develop. It's so super important. I don't want to do much talking today because we've got two guests, which is so exciting. So I'm going to first hand over to Ella Doran to share her insight into other income streams. Over to you, Ella. Thank you. So good morning, uh, no, good afternoon, really, everyone. And thank you so much, Caroline and Tanvi, for inviting me to today's talk. Diversification, I think that's been one of my big uh, wins in a way. I've been in business for over 20 years, and I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of my career with some seminal examples of, um, in a way, how I've diversified. But also, it's been a career of collaboration in, in, in full, and, and communication has been so key, as well as delivering my passion, which is to bring joy and then uplift the everyday. So to start with, I wanted to take you back <clears throat> to my student days, because if you can kind of cast your mind possibly to before you were born um, 
And this was pre-digital in a way. This was a time when I had my SLR camera and I would use it to uh, gain inspiration for my textile designs. And on graduating um, through the degree show, I was lucky enough to obtain lots of contacts. And the design on the left is very much an example of how I started to sell my work on graduating. And I joined a freelance group called First Eleven Studio. And I was lucky enough if, if I were to find a design that I had sold on a product in the marketplace. And this is just an example of a shirt that I found selling in Harvey Nichols. I also wanted to show how I would sell a design on the left, albeit a bit dark as an image, but the translation on the right was curious to me. And I, I, I think that started my curiosity of, I wanna be involved in this. And I joined my licenses regularly because I wanted to also understand how things were selling and, and to really see it in the world. So I traveled to New York and to Paris and designs again, like the one on the left would sell and then be expanded onto a bedding collection. And that again, got me very excited and thinking I wanna be involved in process. Again, from the degree show, I met a lovely woman who invited me to work with her in Africa because she enjoyed the textiles that I had created using very simple, basic techniques of discharge and, and various. And so I was very quick to off, take up the offer and um, jumped on a plane, having raised some money through selling my textile designs. And the idea also was that whilst I was there, I was funded by selling, sending more back to England. Um, but I wanted to again share this because this is where my camera started to become even more of a vehicle than inspiration. I started to use it quite literally as a design tool. And then on returning, I stumbled across an idea. Now we can buy this sort of thing in snappy snaps these days, or, or at least process this. But at the time it was finding a manufacturer that could do this work, working with my 35 millimeter images. And again, I include this for a couple of things. One. This is a trade show stand, it's kind of laughable. I attracted people because it did look uh, busy and curious, it, it brought people in and then they wondered what I was selling, whether I was just selling table mats or whether I was selling the beakers and all the, the, the dyes and um, uh, spices. But that got me talking and in talking, I was able to sell. So be aware of how you, how you um, yes, commercialize your work. And for me, it was through trade shows to start with. So here are some early designs. And on beginning to sell, obviously they needed to be packaged. I needed to think about something that I could do in my workshop to compile it and using stamps. And so the collections grew. Now, licensing has been another key part of my diversification really over the years. And I wanted to share one of my first ones here, which was with a table napkin company. And it seems potentially not just trite, but quite basic. And yet this ended up being an eight year relationship. And it was all from my approach at a trade show. I walked onto their stand because I was also exhibiting uh, at the same show in Germany. And I introduced myself and I brought on my table linens that I'd hand dyed and hand printed and stitched. And I had been selling, but only to the Conran and Ali Capolino, I think, but most people were saying they were too expensive. So I offered them to this uh, group, Stevo, and suffice to say, a long relationship ensued of uh, my seasonal collections coming out and developing. I would literally hand over my designs to them and they would select the collections they wanted to go forward with. Similarly, at the same trade show, I was intrigued by a company that was working with uh, melon tray, trays effectively, but they were beginning to use photographic technology. And bearing in mind, this was the, this was the sort of pioneering time of digital applications onto 3D objects. And so I approached this Italian firm and they, they were quite chauvinistic in a way and sort of laughed at me in all honesty at being someone so young who was up for working with them because their minimum was 3000 units. And I say that now because if you ask me to produce something with 3000 
now I would probably leave the room or I'd need to know that you had the marketplace for it. But at this point in my career, I was blissfully ignorant. And in a way that that drove me to make a success of it. And I did, I did sell 3000 of three designs. I mean, which was 9000 in total, but it took probably three years and shipping from Italy was a big deal and distribution, storage, all of these things I was suddenly having to learn about. So these presented challenges that as a designer, I hadn't been prepared for. I also wanted to quickly um, example this uh, collection, which was again, a, a sort of development from the trays and the table mats. I wanted to develop ceramics. And I had been introduced to this company through Conran, I think I started selling through them. So my relationship I felt was clear that they were producing the product for me. But in so doing, I hadn't had confidentiality agreements. And I'm sure you're all aware of those, probably Crafts Council we talked about them. But be sure if you are subcontracting your work out there with production, be sure that you as the designer have clear guidelines. Um, yeah, I, I learned the hard way with this one. They sold, uh, they didn't see it was behind my back. They actually thought it was good for me. But it, what transpired was selling it to uh, Gallery Lafayette in Paris and um, at half the price, because effectively they were selling it to them as the, the same price they were selling it to me. So there was no margin. And it was my agent that alerted me to this. So with a legal battle ensuing, I was challenged. Challenged as a designer, I was creating things like this, which again, uh, this took a lot longer to sell in a way. And now I'm still getting questions whether I still have this because it's kind of more relevant to today's market. So on the back of that, I got approached by this lady here, the late Susan Williams Ellis. She runs, she was the forefinder of Port Marion Potteries. And she wanted to, collaborate, in essence, to take on my collection under license. And um, I remember recalling thinking, well, this doesn't really speak of my designs. But if I look back on her and her career in the 60s, in her heyday, she was uh, doing wonderful work that really inspired me. So I felt like this was a perfect kind of marriage within that, that, that way of working. And it enabled me to hand over my designs and the company would take over production and distribution and it elevated my brand into a far wider audience which then allowed me to have time to get back to what I love and that is designing so here's yeah, the collections and the trade shows grew up as well as you can see so commissions have been a huge part of my career um, <clears throat> not least for retailers um, but also um, the wonderful museums. So the Tate Museum I've worked with uh, many years now, but this particular collection was when my children were young. So it was a perfect time to create. And again, why I share it today is books are notoriously not a great earner, but the product that we related to the books because of all my experience that I'd gained through production of my own and then through the Port Marion uh, um, collaboration meant that I could understand and could could work with big volumes. So suddenly, three thousand of something wasn't such an issue with a great retailer like the Tate. And we had an exhibition for children, um, which was wonderful. For a day, they were able to put their own artwork up on the wall at Tate Modern. And similarly, we had an event for uh, the, the second book, which was a book on color. Now, I also wanted to share, there's so many different um, examples of licensing, and those previous ones were through the wholesaler, the, the Port Marion were wholesaling onto retailers. And this was now an example of when I worked directly with the retailer. And here, this is John Lewis. Um, you will see a huge array of designs and collections, but how this came about was through the late uh, Peter Levi, who, Patricia van den Ecker, who you mentioned earlier, um, used to work for, and uh, it was Design Nation that put this talk together. So again, reach out for all the opportunities that come your way through Crafts Council, whatever it will be, 
even though this was design council every platform is is there to help you and what this meant this was it was commercial but i also found it incredibly creative because i was working one-to-one -one with the buyers because of my knowledge with production it meant that i could also work very closely with the makers, the, the, the actual manufacturers, whether be they in China or Europe or the UK, and there was the whole rainbow of, of countries that they work with, and develop collections across their whole uh, remit, um, tableware, boxes, stationery, melamine kitchen, wrapping paper, and indeed um, bathroom. I will just say that, that that period of my life was, as I mentioned, incredibly creative, but it was also extremely exhausting. I, I, was, I felt like I was a machine at times. I probably had about four or five people working for me, but it was relentless. And John Lewis as an entity are an incredible organization and retailer, and they are exemplary in the way they work with their employees. Um, but for me, I could tell that after a three year stint, my my time was not going to last in that capacity not least because i was feeling this sense of newness all the time and not celebrating what was being done and i guess that's another part of my design career and my design ethos is that there is longevity imbued in the work that i do so i was lucky enough to actually get invited to pitch. Now, this was the first time I'd ever pitched for work because uh, through probably the exhibiting and the fantastic collaborations I'd had, work kept coming to me. And so this one pitching was a new, new thing for me. And this was the design, the curtains for the Royal London Children's Hospital, which was extremely humbling, uh, very rewarding. And again, because of my production experience, I was able to challenge the, not just the state. Uh, cool. So just to pick up, um, I then also expanded from the uh, curtains to tabletops and cabinets. So use your knowledge where you can and feel confident with your client on what you can offer. Awards have been a fantastic uh, enabler, I shall say. And on the back of this award, I got approached by a rug company and took my original design back to its true essence in a way about light um, and shadow and a 3D form and made this topical rug by carving out from, from the uh, woven piece. Other rugs. So, Again, the wonderful world of, of internet, and I then developed my website and my own collections again post the John Lewis time. And these are some of the collections. Nurture your relationships. Um, I put this in because 10 years after my first commissions with Tate, I worked with them again. And I think over the years, that's another thing I can really say that the Relationships I've made from the very beginning have stayed true. And um, that's a wonderful community has, has grown with that, which I really value. Invest in your own exhibitions. I wanted to insert this because um, on the back of the work that I'd done with um, John Lewis and then the purposeful work I felt with the um, hospital, I started to question my material and my production and also the value of, of things. And so I wanted to run a workshop live during the Design Festival in London and collaborate with um, another RSA member, The Great Recovery, Sophie Thomas. And we ran a live uh, reupholstery event where it enabled me to create a textile design. And I'd fortuitously been to Iceland, which blew me away with the colours and the landscape and the colour of the water, never mind their lighthouses, and developed some designs that I then created a textile, quite a wacky one at that. But we then, under live conditions, so the public were coming in and watching and questioning and seeing this old um, love seat of my grandmother's take on a new life. And what we were wanting to celebrate or really address was the bulky waste issue that um, we have in this country. And this was uh, nearly 10 years ago. And 
there's I'm very happy to say I think there's a huge awareness around this now not least with TV programs the lovely Jay on money for nothing and things are really bringing that to the wider public awareness and again to make that work for myself commercially I, I did create a collection that I could then sell through the site so in in investing in an exhibition it then told a story that I could then sell new work and I think storytelling as we know is so key to how you develop I wanted to share this as well because I'm a passionate advocate of the circular economy and I'm sure you're all aware but the three main principles are to design out waste and pollution to keep products and materials in use and to regenerate natural systems that's to work within the natural systems we can now time is of the essence so I'm going to continue to whistle stop I work with the Great Recovery and we went on a residency to further investigate the bulky waste situation, quite literally, and retrieve a sofa that we brought back to a, an exhibition. Um, exhibitions have been key for new relationship finding. And here we met with a textile company, Chimera, and they were perfectly, uh, I say perfectly because it was wonderful synergy with us and them. They wanted to create a new Turk style working with waste wool. And so um, myself and three other designers were able to help them bring that into fruition and also tell a story with the sofa that we'd retrieved, which ended up being a film called The Survivor Sofa, which you can see on YouTube, I believe, or maybe on the RSA website. Um, I recently one worked with the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. They were celebrating uh, 20, 40 years, not even 20, 40 years of art without walls. It's a fantastic place to visit. And I started with my camera and um, also went back to painting and drawing and observing the color around the park and brought that into a collection and in order to make that into a collection for manufacture, we had to work with Pantone colors transferred from the colors of the park. And so we created a palette in the collection. And this was the result. But the reason I share that is whilst I was doing this, I dreamt up my own project, which I then had to go and get sponsored. And that was to explore the circular economy through one material, through wool. So I really reached out to all my previous collaborators and new ones and formed an exhibition that told the story and followed the wool from the sheep on the backs at Yorkshire Sculpture Park all the way through the lives it has to go through. And I'll quickly flush through this. But the, the um, scouring plant for me was amazing. And the film really brings that to life and just how many processes wool fiber has to go in to get to where you then make something and we transferred that into a jacquard weave and then again excuse the noise but the the uh, commissioners or the people that sponsored me were um this company which made rugs and the floor runner which is still selling now and jacquard weaving and we made chairs it was a way of exploring how many things can we make out of wool and this is probably my most prized piece where there's muck, there's brass, and it's actually a solid wool set in resin and encased in brass. And I couldn't have predicted the marriage of the two colors was fantastic. People go up to it thinking it's marble and then you realize up close. And there's the film. How are we doing for time? I think we should probably end it there. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Ella. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Yes. Great. So Caroline has some um, reception issues. So I'm just um, coming in now. Um, Wonderful. So I will stop sharing. And so yeah, Laura can take over. Thank you so much for that lovely um, in well, introduction spanning many years of your yes. Um And we'll, I'll just hand over to Flora and then we'll all return, hopefully with Caroline as well, um, at the end to go through the Q&A. So thank you everyone who already has um, sent some comments and questions, we'll get to them at the end. So thank you Ella, we'll see you in a little while. Um, and Flora, welcome, and I'll just invite you to share your Hello. screen. Great, I will get my screen set up. There we go, so 
Um, thank you so much, Ella. That was so interesting. I really enjoyed seeing that little snapshot of all your work. I think there's nothing more exciting than seeing a little glimpse into someone else's career. Um, so I'm Flora Collingwood Norris. I am a knitwear designer, maker and visible mender based in the Scottish borders in Gala Shields. Um, give me a minute, I get nervous, so I'm going to talk too fast and I'll just take a deep breath. Um, I graduated 12 years ago with a degree in design for textiles from Harriet Watt University in Gala Shields. And ever since then, I have basically been self-employed. Um, I haven't always had my own label. I started Collingwood Norris five years ago. And in fact, exactly five years ago, um, this month, I started my web shop. Um, but before that, I worked freelance, um, where my work has included swatch design, um, which is where you design a mini garment front and other companies can buy it. So I suppose slightly like the licensing that Ella was talking about. Um, I've also designed catwalk, uh, not designed, I've created catwalk samples for clients that have included Christopher Kane and Jasper Conran and House of Holland, um, where I've helped with fabric development and then created the, the sample that, that ends up on the catwalk. Um, my work has also included teaching. I've worked at Harriet Watt University and Duncan of Jordanston, College of Art and Design in Dundee. Um, and what else have I done? I have worked for a local uh, design consultancy company that work globally. Um, and I've, again, worked on fabric development and ideas for, for trend areas at trade shows um, with them. Um, I've created prototypes for all sorts of different people um, and worked with local companies developing hand-knit designs using their own wool that they grow on their farm. So my work has always been sort of quite diverse, I suppose. It's always been within knitwear. It's largely been based around my hand skills of knitting and crochet and embroidery. Um, but in 2016, I decided I was ready to start my own label. Um, I think really because I wanted to feel like I was slightly more in control of my own income and my own destiny. Because when you're freelance and working for other people, you're very much at the mercy of, of their whims um, and they can change their mind at any point and you can suddenly be left without the job you'd hoped was coming. So I work from a home studio here in Gala Shields. Um, I'm now slightly bursting at the seams. I am slightly outgrowing it. Um, but I have an old industrial knitting machine and a domestic knitting machine. Um, and I, I make a lot of the products, I make a lot of the designs myself still. Um, for the first, I think, three years of the business, I made everything. I did have a, a student who helped me half a day a week, but otherwise, yeah, I was making everything myself. Um, but I have recently started working with one of my local mills in Hoik, so I can have pieces made half an hour away from me, which is amazing. Um, and that has really opened up the design possibilities I have, as well as taking off some of the pressure from me for, for making time. Um, you will have seen from that last picture that um, I love colour. Colour is a big part of my work. Um, and I'm hugely passionate about working with natural fibres. I've always wanted to create an ethical business that values the skills that are part of it. And I want to be an environmentally conscious business. So I'm very aware of um, what impact my, my pieces will have. It's one of the reasons I choose natural fibers. They're biodegradable. Um, the spinner I get my lamb's wool from, they use global organic textile standard approved dyes. Um, they have to work in a sustainable way because their waste water goes back into their local loch so it has to, you know, they, they're not allowed to kill off wildlife. So it has to be environmentally friendly. They have to clean up their waste, which is great. Um, and what else? Yes. So, so my work is currently all about colour. But in terms of income stream, for the first three years of my business, it was really quite narrow. Um, I had, I started my business with wholesale. Um, so when I, very, I, when I first started Collingwood Norris, I think I had a collection of a whole six scarves um, and 
I started selling them in some small sort of gift type shops in Scotland. Um, and I have done some trade shows since then, but so I've always, I've had a wholesale element to my business. Um, I have online sales as well. So I have my own website. Um, and then I also do direct sales at craft fairs. So selling direct to the public, which has been really important so that people can get to know me and feel my products because when it's textiles and it's particularly wool you really want to feel it to know that it's a quality you're, you're happy to wear and you like the way it feels so the craft fairs have been yeah a really important bit for my income um and i'm i'm knitwear so my business is um it's very seasonal i really only sell in winter months and i mostly sell in the run-up to christmas so while I was starting Collingwood Norris, although I was doing some teaching at the very beginning as well, um, I've had some sort of some really scary moments where I've just had to grip my teeth and plan for autumn as much as I can so that I'm ready when the season starts, because it can be really scary when you're starting and um, you're still on quite a low income um, and you don't really know what's going to happen or how things are going to work. So, so that's how, how I started. Um, and then in 2019, I launched a visible mending and creative knitwear repair service. And this was really the, the start of me diversifying my income streams um, within Collingwood Norris. I, I've always been interested in the end life of a garment um, and of my knitwear particularly. It's part of wanting to be an environmentally conscious business is that I want to think about what happens when an elbow wears through or the cuffs tear and fray um, or someone's fed up with their scarf, what, what happens to it then? Um, so I'd started repairing my own knitwear. I'm very lucky that I have a mum who loves charity shop shopping um, and has bought me many secondhand jumpers over the years that I've been wearing for, um, yeah, many years now. So, so I'd started repairing my own knitwear and sharing that on my Instagram and people started asking me to repair their knitwear for them. So after that happened a couple of times, I decided I would, I would make that an official service that I offered. And I started a separate Instagram account just for visible mending. Um, yeah, and that was, the Instagram account has really taken off. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's been great. People are very interested in seeing, you know, very specific bits about mending. Um, and the great thing about the repair side of the business is that I can work it around the knitwear making side, particularly in the quieter months. So it's it's really helped during summer months. Um, although it's still a bit unreliable and it, you know, people tend to look out or tend to find their holy pieces of knitwear um, in autumn when they dig out their knitwear and find that it's been eaten by moths. So there's still a, a seasonal element to it, but the repair side of the business helped. And I also started offering in-person workshops around 2019. Um, but then 2020 happened and I had planned lots of in-person workshops starting from the end of March, which was when the pandemic hit. So they had to be canceled. All my wholesale stopped overnight really. And there were almost no in-person events, which were, something that I really relied on for quite a chunk of my income. So because I didn't want to lose the income from workshops, I created a digital version of all the information that I would have covered. Um, it's a mix of PDF guides and videos, a pack of materials, piece of yarn, so that my customers could learn at home. Um, and I expanded it to create a range of guides, um, PDFs and videos, as well as packs of darning wool. I realized that I'm very lucky being, you know, with, with my knitwear design that I pretty much live in a room full of yarn that is really quite, you know, it's good quality. It's 100% natural fiber, it's 100% wool, or I also sometimes use silk. And it's also really, it's really fine which is something that most people don't have access to and they certainly couldn't afford to buy it in the quantities that I buy it 
especially if they just want to mend a jumper. So I started creating packs of my wool and I have been using wool that's left over from previous projects. You know, some of it's even left over from when I was at university. So it's using up waste. It's essentially pre-consumer waste. Um, and it allows me to offer my customers something that they otherwise can't get. Um, before Christmas, I printed out a little darning leaflet um, and made a pack with materials and, and a needle and this leaflet so that people could start giving a skill, which I have to admit, like, I, I think is a great idea. I think more people want experiences. It's a way of not buying stuff. Um, I really don't like the giving of stuff, a thing for the sake of it. Um, I like things to be beautiful and useful and have a purpose. And what could be better than giving someone a, a skill for life? So I, I introduced kits before Christmas. Um, and in 2020, I also had some time at the beginning of the pandemic to work on um, some new knitwear pieces, new colorways. Um, and I started offering the option of customization adding a little darned square to my scarves, um, which is a nice way of kind of marrying the two sides of my business together. Um, I was also still doing darning commissions, mending commissions during 2020. Um, the joy of the postal service <laughs> um, you can still do that remotely and that, that was fine. So I was again, able to work during my sort of naturally quieter times of my business, which is sort of spring and early summer. Um, yeah, and that, that made a huge difference to my business, actually. Um, offering something new at a low price range has, has really changed things for me. It used to be that my product started at £50, I think, before the pandemic hit, um, and they ranged to sort of £200. Um, and really, you know, the £50 is for fingerless, fingerless mitts, which aren't a, a big seller for me. So really it's about hundred pounds is my lowest price point for a scarf or 95. Um, so it's a lot to ask people to spend. And then suddenly I had videos and PDF guides that were 10 pounds and yeah, that, that's made a huge difference. So although I had, um, I didn't have any wholesale anymore and there weren't really any in-person events, having a different price range and a new income stream has really has saved my business. Actually, I was getting to a point where I was unsure if I could carry on with Collingwood Norris or not. But now, not only have I added something in that I feel really fits with what I want for my business, you know, I want it to be environmentally friendly. I want people to be caring for their clothes. I want people to understand the work that goes into them so that they do want to care for their clothes. All of those are really, really important to me. And so having the mending side and offering the mending skills really fits with that, I think. And it, I really enjoy it. Um, it's constantly creative. Every mend is different. Um, and it's, and it, yeah, and it's really, really changed my income. So what has been quite crucial for this diversifying has been understanding what my customers want. And while I'll be the first to admit that when it comes to my knitwear, I'm less clear on that. Um, I find that harder to work out, but when it comes to the mending side of my business, I completely understand it. My customers want to see detailed pictures of mending um, and they would like to know how to do it. And that's really it. So I keep thinking about that and I keep thinking about what I can offer my customers that will fit with what they want whether that's packs of yarn, really nice color combinations, new videos, um, new skills, new ways of sharing things. Um, it always comes back to what does my customer actually want? Um, and that has been really helpful. And I will also mention Patricia van der Ecker because I use um, the Design Trust's planner every year. And while I, I dip in and out of it, I find it really useful. So I highly recommend that if you need some sort of structure to your year with useful pointers. Um, this year, I decided to write a mending book. Um, I have been, I've been approached by three different publishers to create a mending book. 
um, but I decided I would self-publish, possibly because I'm crazy, I'm not quite sure, but it means I feel like I'm more in control of the process. Um, and the joy of self-publishing is that I've been able to work on the content of the book during my quieter time of the year and get it printed and published for now. It's out, it, they arrived last week. Um, I'm now, this is my one hour out of my day of packing books, it's great. Um, but it's allowed me to produce it really quite quickly so that I could bring it out just before my busy season begins um, to sort of try and spread, again, try and spread my income out throughout the year, which is always my challenge. Um, this year, I've also started offering online workshops um, to teach mending. And while I was really reluctant to do it to begin with, I actually think it's wonderful. Again, it opens my, it opens the workshops up globally rather than being limited to my, I don't know, hour radius of where I'm based. Um, because I'm based in quite a small town in the Scottish borders, I normally feel like I have to travel somewhere else to teach a workshop, which is normally Edinburgh. And that's an hour away from, from me. So it's quite a big time commitment just travel wise to teach an in-person workshop. And the joy with online is that obviously I don't have to travel. I can teach people anywhere in the world. Um, and I think in many ways, they can see what I'm doing much better than if I was teaching in person. Nobody's sitting at the other end of a table um, where they can't really see. They can see pretty much what I'm seeing. They get a, a view directly over my hands of what I'm doing, um, which I think is great. The only issue with it is that I can't see what they're doing quite as clearly, which is challenging. But that's that's been a great new, a new thing that I've added. I've really been, just been doing that since June. Um, I've also recently been creating new mending videos so that I have video content that complements the book, as well as working on small products using up uh, waste fabrics that I have. So whether that's mending kits or lavender bags, something, you know, I can never throw away fabric because you, you just don't do that. Not when you've spent hours making it, even if it goes wrong. So fabric I've been saving from the last five years, I'm now trying to turn that into something that I can that I can sell that my customers might be interested. And I'm trying to keep it around clothing care. So I'm trying to help people to look after their clothing and keep it for years. Um, and what else? <laughs> the knitwear side of my business has taken a little bit of a back seat this year. Um, I am still doing it. It's still something that I really love. I love designing and making things, but I've not had the time because I've been working on the book this year to really create new products. So hopefully that will be fine. But diversifying my income and not relying just on knitwear has been really quite crucial, I think, to change my business and make it, make it something that I could actually live off rather than something that I maybe have to think, okay, I have to get a second job or something. Um, which I really didn't want to do because I really wanted Collingwood Norris to work. So it's taken a long time and I feel like I'm not especially good at long-term strategy perhaps with my business. I do try, but my ideas change. And actually I think that's one of the benefits of being a small business is that you can be flexible and adaptable and you can often do it quite fast. So, for example, when a pandemic hits and everything suddenly gets cancelled, you can adapt and change and offer something different, provide people with an experience or a new, you know, a new skill. Um, yeah, and that's that's definitely helping Collingwood Norris grow, reach new people. People, my customers are finding me through mending, but that doesn't mean that they're not interested in knitwear and vice versa. So I think there's definitely a crossover in the, the two customers. And yeah, I, I think that's me. I think that's it. So let me work out how to stop screen sharing. Wonderful. There we go. Laura, thank you so much. Um, I really love that um, final statement about 
small businesses can be flexible and adaptable um and you know a real testament to you for finding new ways to really uh make a sound business coming out of the pandemic uh so thank you so much for that um i'm just going to invite tamby on screen as well to uh talk about the q a that's come in yeah thank you first of all yeah huge thank you to both of you ella and flora that was brilliant such vibrant images as well to compliment the incredible uh, things you've been up to. Um, there's been, and thank you the audience as well for your questions and comments. There's been some lovely sort of um, people enjoying the talk and uh, lots of uh, questions. There's a few which have a real common theme about advice for makers today, having the markets really different from obviously Ella, when you started. Yeah, yeah. You do, I know that you work with students. So perhaps there's sort of, um, this questions for both of you. So Flora, you can also pop in. Um, if there's makers who feel that the market's pretty saturated, how do they, is there any specific advice to you makers, especially to obtain opportunities that really elevate your practice? Mm. I think I saw that in the chat. And um, as you mentioned, I am, I am now tutoring a lot. That was one of my diversifications during lockdown as I got some work at the Royal College. But one thing I think on the 3D products that was queried, I would think, Think in different scales for starters. If, if you're a potter, what would happen to your pots or your ideas if you scaled them up and approached architects for architectural stuff? And so step outside of your one income or your maybe many income students, but just it, scale can help you change something and change the way you look at the way you're working. So that would be one bit of advice. Um, and, and with that scale, think of industries that, you know, is it, could it be medical? Could it be uh, collaborating with chemists and um, physicists on other things? You know, that, that we are becoming a world of creators with the sciences. So again, I think actually, Flora, you're a wonderful example of how your mending side has opened up all the more probably your business reach as well, because it, it, uh, it speaks to so many more people because it becomes personal for them. And I think that's so powerful and, and interesting with your own work, it's so beautiful, uh, but I can relate to that from my work is that you end up, if it's coming from you, that might not always suit everyone else. Whereas if you're engaging with people to engage them in a, in a, in a practice, it's something very wonderful in that. And so uh, it's been a side I've, I've also seen develop for myself and, and mentoring, I see as a kind of reciprocity you know, there's, it goes both ways. I, I gain from it, not just give to it, if that makes sense. I hope that's helpful. I also think for people when it comes to diversifying, you don't have to do it within your, you know, it doesn't have to be within ceramics, does it? Or, you know, exactly. for me, it hasn't actually been creating a smaller knitted product or a bigger one. It's been doing slight something slightly off to the side. And it's probably worth remembering that you have skills that are not just making ceramic skill, skills. Yeah. There's going to be visual skills involved. There'll be, you know, a whole host of other things that actually you can be creative in and you could delve into if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, it's what put me off for years because I remember reading in the design planner thing that, you know, could you have a, a product at a lower base? And I was thinking, well, I really can't think of anything small that I could create that wouldn't still take loads of time and then have to be at the same price point but actually stepping away from knitwear and making that specific <laughs> box that I felt I was in has mm. opened it up so so it's maybe just a slight sidestep mm. it doesn't have to be completely different just using the skills you already have in a slightly different way totally agree and also reach out see that there's so many opportunities in uh artists artist newsletter for instance on commissions you know again that you might think as a ceramicist oh i don't know if i could do that but like you say flora you could apply that to graphics or apply it to to a different way of of looking and i think reach out to um potential commissions that might you know it might be a, a case of you're not getting it but it still opens your eyes to new ways of developing your own work Um, that kind of leads us on to 
um, some really specific sort of advice that is kind of hidden away and not really, can't really navigate it because that information isn't out there. For instance, advice on finding a textile agent or how would you approach finding, you know, con collaborating with a very sort of, somebody who hasn't proposed for, this is an application call for a partnership. How would you approach those sort of contacts? So the agent perhaps, because that was a really specific question um, from Beatrice. Um, and then connecting to contacting maybe almost like cold calling but sort of warming up that process yeah shall i, shall I answer that I'll actually yes, please i have no experience start, start. Really. <laughs> um again i think um the agents in textiles for instance have trade shows is a good place to start even if it's going on the website and looking at the list of exhibitors and who they are that's what i'd advise um, because if you're getting an agent, they've got to get your work out there. So they will have a presence on the web. And so it's research, it's research, it's a lot of research. And then cold calling, be, you know, flip it. Imagine someone approaching you on a call and how, what would what would surprise you? You know, what would get your attention and approach it that way, whether it is actually a, a handwritten card and a and a link, or whether it's through the internet. And um, I think, you know, we've got such a made, I've got a funny story now, which is so, you know, the, the internet has opened up so much, but I remember one time when I was desperate to get to the press office of a, a retailer that I was selling my new, the rugs in actually, and they weren't answering my calls. So I tweeted, I, I tweeted it and saying, I've got better pictures, look at them here or something. And immediately the press office got back to me. But they weren't, you know, so it's it's think of new ways. I mean, that's a pretty obvious one through Twitter and various. But um, yeah, I think look, researching is key. And and then, you know, your approach is down to your individual approach. Yeah. And I wonder what also to bring into that is thinking about what you want out of the collaboration and be really, really honest with yourself. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I hear certain makers sort of like saying, or oh, I'd love to collaborate with them or them. And I go, why why is it and and if it's down to just uh, raising your own profile think about what you can give back to that person to make an attractive proposition so it's really drilling down on the why um and, and uh, we've done a recent project where we're encouraging people to do an art swap um to try new materials and just doing something together to try something different it might not have an outcome that leads to a new product but it enables you to think differently That's to great. work collaboratively um, and have a discussion about the creative process because you learn from that experience don't you that's wonderful yeah great really good advice yeah. stretches you <laughs> Just going to pop in a chat for all the, the audience here. Um, for a recent fund, the one to one fund from the Derwood Arts, which is about working yeah. with others. Um, yeah. So, I, when um, it's the derwoodarts.org, so I've just popped the, the link in there, but they're sort of asking for people who want to work together, even for the first time, apply for this. So, that might be quite interesting. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. So. Are there any? Quest, other questions, Tanvi, from the Q&A? Specifically for uh, Flora's book, um, mm -hmm. for instance, there's a couple there. Uh, which company did you use to print your self-published book? Um, I used a company called Bell & Bain in Glasgow, who were recommended to me by another knitter who'd had good experience with them. So fits in perfectly. I like having things manufactured in the UK if I can have them manufactured locally even though locally is kind of two hours away from me then that's perfect and yeah. I got to go and visit them and everything that was you know I've never seen so much paper in my life but really nice to see the process and be talked through it and see the books coming off the press at the end. Yeah I think that's wonderful that's a really great uh, and also like you say to self-publish gave you the autonomy to to drive that yourself I think that was really smart. Very yeah and it's I mean uh, the advice I was given by this self-published knitter is that, you know, only do it if you actually think you're willing to go and try and sell the book because yeah. that you have to do all of that. Yeah. And like you say, storage and all of those things, they're all... It's a job. <laughs> it's, it's, but, um, 
but it have does you actually me... employed anyone to help you with this or have you been running this all yourself uh well, I'm, i've you know brought, drafted my dad to help me with books when they arrive that sort of thing but otherwise it's You've it's done. me at the moment i had hoped to have help but it hasn't kind of hasn't managed to happen in time so mm. i've got it set up i've got a system now i think it's i think it's all going but I'm going to develop a whole load of muscles that I never had before from the few books because they are really heavy. Um, Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think um, we'll bring this session to a close. Thank you so much, Ella. Thank you so much, Flora. Um, it is uh, such a joy to have you both here to round up this Spring Back Talk series. And hopefully this has inspired our audience to really think about diversifying um, your income streams and thinking outside the box, thinking collaboratively, research. So, you know, we will say that time and time again, it's so important to research and be brave and tenacious. I, I like that idea of just reaching out in a bit of a different way. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you to Crafting Europe for funding these talks. That's uh, it from us, from the Crafts Council. Going to ask Tanvi to release the poll. Um, and this poll has got five questions on it because we want to ask you, what is the impact of these talks? Um, for your business so we can plan future support um, for you next year but don't fear all of our Springback talks are published on our Crafts Council YouTube um, site so you can go back and review all of these um, amazing discussions we've had across the summer and hopefully that whole insight into your values your customers, giving the most out of social media, working with press, honing your writing skills, making the most of the experience economy, diversifying your, diversifying your income screen, streams can all support the development of your businesses. And as Flora, you've really indicated, sort of enabling you to be flexible and adaptable so that you can stay in a full-time business. So thank you. Thank you to Tanvi, my colleague. Um, and uh, again, thank you to everyone that's joined us on this journey. See you next time. Thank you, guys. Thank Love you. Take care. Bye. Bye.